warm welcome to everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, governments of the region. Uh, I know it's a bit of an unusual time, uh, but in a, in a very um, unusual manner, we have our colleagues from Australia already joining us from their Friday. We're still here on, on Thursday, and, and we promise the government of the region, we promise our Australian colleague a nice um, present of uh, Latin American coffee because it's, it's seven in the morning for you. So thank you so much <laughs> for joining us, Australia. Um, and, and I will immediately introduce our other exciting uh, panelists joining us today. I will, I will thanks to them as well. So yes, I'm Rosa Roban, working for CIFR in the uh, climate change and low energy uh, development team. And today we're having session two of this uh, Blue Carbon webinar um, that has a very long title. These are steps towards self-standing blue carbon emission reporting and mitigation targets under the Paris Agreement and the Voluntary Carbon Market. Um, we already had session one and uh, there you can have a bit more information about the context. I just wanted to mention and, and offer our gratitude to our donor, the USAID, and this Blue Carbon webinar is focused uh, as, a, as a support to reg regional governments in uh, Latin America. Um, and actually it's responding some of the questions that these governments uh, presented as, as barriers and also as opportunities for developing their self-standing blue carbon programs uh, within the UNFCCC, but also uh, under voluntary carbon market. So in the first session, we were looking at these differences um, between these two options. And you can uh, look at the audios and the recordings and the slides from the first session in the link that I'm sharing here with you. Um, and as Isabel uh, mentioned, this webinar is also part of the SWOM program, which is a sustainable wetland adaptation and mitigation program. And also in the link of SWOM, you can get a lot of information about what SIPO does in terms of wetlands, not only mangroves, but also peatlands, um, coastal wetlands, and other type of, of tropical wetlands. There is uh, geo-information data, and there are articles, published data, etc. Um, also, I'd like to uh, introduce our first session by recalling that on the 27th of July, this Sunday, we're going to celebrate the International Day of Mangroves. Um, we spent some time the other day discussing all these ecosystem services that mangroves provide. Very important right now in this year 2020, which in the Caribbean is going to be a busy hurricane season. We have forecasted uh, many more tropical storms and um, hurricanes and large category hurricanes than, than in Asmin because we, we have a very warm ocean that's been hit, uh, heated for a long time and then we have a no El Nino condition. So these two things together with more active monsoon in West Africa are going to make this uh, hurricane season a, um, a hectic one. So, so let's celebrate the role of mangroves in protecting our coasts and our um, communities from the coast from um, storm surges from hurricanes from sea level rise besides many other ecosystem services like like fish and food security and, and like biodiversity sustain and, and water filtering and whatnot mangroves are super trees i am sharing here with you um our latest podcasts that we will be uh c4 will be uh sharing with all of you uh on the mangrove day uh, we had two exciting podcasts, one in Spanish, the other in English, around the role of mangroves as coastal protection, and particularly in the case of the Caribbean and their role against uh, hurricanes. So if you're interested in, to, in this topic, please take a look at, uh, at these two web uh, links that I'm offering you. The, um, uh, the communication uh, link for the Let's Talk Trees, which is a, a, a series of discussions with C4 uh, researchers and also other researchers discussing about different types of trees and ours will be mangroves and then also please follow the forest news there you will see uh, the latest uh, development of the podcast and other season uh, other topics of, of podcasts very briefly and we're going to jump immediately into the presentation of the our panelists um, but I just wanted to remember those of you who are joining today for the first time a bit of the context of this Blue Carbon uh, Session 2 webinar. Uh, we were discussing the other day that uh, Blue Carbon is starting to be so popular that also is starting to be defined in two very different ways. Uh, for the 
governments in the region, and there is not an official definition uh, and, and the, the UNFCCC, there is some discussion of what blue carbon is on the special report of um, cryosphere and oceans. But other than that, there is not uh, officially, it's not officially defined under UNFCCC. So for us, for the region, blue carbon uh, relates to three coastal ecosystems, mangroves, coastal wetlands, and seagrasses. For the circumstances in the region, mangroves is the only one that we are focusing when talking about um, blue carbon in most of the countries. Mexico also has seagrasses already into their line of action. And today we will have an excellent example of how other countries are having their blue carbon emissions in a much more systemic, um, wider meaning. So incorporating not only mangroves, but also seagrasses and, and coastal wetlands. Australia will be discussing their blue carbon program. But just as context for Latin American countries, when we talk about blue carbon, we're mainly focusing on mangroves. Okay? Uh, the other thing that is important, these webinars have um, a touch of mitigation, even though we are very aware that uh, mangroves offer other types of ecosystem services that are not mitigation related. Um, like, as we mentioned, all the others before, adaptation is extremely important, sea level rise. But because um, we were interested in NDCs mitigation uh, as a way to support countries to incorporate that aspect, since already countries are including mangroves and blue carbon in the NDCs as adaptation. So adaptation is, is, could be improved, but it's mitigation that we are trying to support these regional uh, governments with. Um, and again, you will see that this webinar is rather focused to certain things and not others. And this is because this comes from the workshop that we did last year in Merida with the regional governments. And we're trying to answer some of their questions. So it's not that there are not many other things that we could be discussing. It's just that we're trying to follow up on that uh, workshop. So having said that, today this session will be shorter than the other one. Uh, but the structure will be the same. We will have our panelists giving their speeches and then uh, we will open the space through the chat uh, for the governments and, and the participants to have their questions. Uh, it is rather important you take the opportunity to, to um, make your questions to this excellent team of experts that we are having today. And we have uh, the pleasure to um, count today on three panelists. We have Tertius de Cleaver, which probably I'm not pronouncing properly, but sorry, Tertius. <laughs> um, Tertius is a senior policy analyst at the Department of the Environment of the Government of Australia. He's a marine biologist and biochemist who has worked a lot in marine science, agriculture, and environmental management since the 80s. Um, he has more than 30, 40 years of experience working with private sector, with academia, with the government, uh, both in Australia and also in the US. And he's currently employed by the government of Australia, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And he's joining us today um, as in the role of expert on wetlands and also um, in the role of uh, coordinating or uh, participating to the greenhouse gas inventory of wetlands in Australia within the uh, branch of the government that is called National Inventory Systems and International Reporting. Uh, Tertius, you are very welcome when you start your presentation to highlight things that I might have said maybe slightly broad or comment on that. So um, thanks very much, Tertius. I will introduce the other panelists as they speak, but let me also welcome Keen, mostly Boston, uh, representative also here today from the government of Guyana. We are extremely welcome that Guyana will be sharing their experiences with the um, mangrove related proposals into the uh, Global Environmental Fund and the Green Climate Fund. They will share some of their experiences, some of the projects that they've um, submitted, some of the tips that they can give to other governments. And then I have the pleasure to also introduce my friend um, next door office uh, colleague from FAO in the time of dinosaurs. So Mark Dumas Johansson, <laughs> welcome. I will also introduce you later on, but um, he is a representative of the Green Climate Fund. So with no further ado, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Tertius after thanking him for being here at seven in the morning and, and taking the, the time to give our governments in the region your lessons learned for the Blue Carbon Program. Um, uh, monitoring. Thanks so much for greenhouse gases. Thanks very much, Rishis. Thank you, Rosa. I'll uh, just start my presentation. 
There we go. Uh, thank you, Rosa. Um, there was a change uh, in the organization of uh, departments uh, in Australia at the end of last year, so that I did work for the Department of the Environment, but that whole branch that uh, we talked about, uh, National Inventory Systems and its national reporting, um, was shifted to another department. So you've actually got both departments correct. Um, I've been in both in the last year. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk. A, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about what we're doing in Australia with respect to um, accounting for carbon in Australia's coastal wetlands in our national inventory reports to the UNFCCC. And so, first thing I would say is one of the reasons why we might look at this is the vastness of uh, this country. Uh, it's nice to be a small continent. We have a significant coastline. Um, depending upon how you measure it, it's somewhere between 52 and 59 uh, thousand kilometers, around which we have, of course, uh, a significant estuarine uh, environment. Tidal marsh um, currently sits at around 2.3 million hectares, mangrove at about 1.1 million hectares, which makes us about third in the world after Brazil and the Indonesia. And seagrass meadows, more than 5 million hectares, but we're not quite sure because we haven't discovered all of the meadows at this point. Um, the reason for looking at these, this, these particular ecosystems uh, is that although they are only about 1% of Australia's terrestrial um, uh, vegetated areas, and we do have a vast uh, arid region in Australia as well with very low vegetation, um, those areas contain about 5% of all of Australia's carbon stores. So, um, and this, this was deduced by uh, Lawrence Baker and Lovelock back in about 2012. Uh, those figures uh, uh, probably need to be updated a little bit, but the areas are fairly consistent. So today's talk um, is really about uh, how we go about uh, accounting for, for carbon from those ecosystems and particularly mangroves. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework and the scope of the accounts, the activities that we currently um, uh, include in the account uh, that uh, impact those environments that we uh, that we are uh, that we monitor um, how we might estimate carbon stock change in those in those areas how we go about it at this time an example of current modeling and some of the lessons learned in the past five years that i've actually been doing this particular job so let's go into um, the accounting scope and framework and where does blue carbon actually fit into all of this Sorry, just to interrupt you. Um, I don't see your slides, so. Oh, don't you? No. Uh, uh, please go to the share screen. Yep. Just um, second, I'm just going to end my slideshow again. Uh, yeah, maybe you um, could stop it and, and do it again. Maybe it's only yep. me who has this problem. Or the panelists, do you? Did you see his slides? So, let me have a look. Uh, now, yeah, perfect. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, well, well uh, that's a bit of a downer. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it was perfect. It was perfect introduction. Yeah. We didn't need the slide so far. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, right. Well, this is the most, this is the first important slide then. Okay, so <laughs> if, we, if we look at the framework um, where uh, coastal wetlands actually sits within uh, our reporting. So we have our national greenhouse gas accounts um, and, and they are there to do a number of different things. And of course, uh, we meet Australia's reporting requirements uh, under both UNFCCC and under KP. Um, this allows us to also track our national emissions from 1990 onwards. Well, actually, uh, when it comes to Lulu CF, uh, Land Use, Land Use Change and Forestry, um, our modelling actually goes back uh, to about 1970, 1972. Uh, we track progress against um, Australia's emission reduction commitments 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our emission reduction fund uh, at towards the end as one of the lessons learned. And of course, it informs policymakers and the public as to where we are at uh, with our uh, management of greenhouse gases in Australia. So what underpins national greenhouse gas accounts and how, and how we monitor all that and, and report it um, is through the guidance under, uh, given by the 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. And of course, volume for agriculture, forestry and other land use is the important uh, volume there. Now, one of the questions that was asked was, well, how do we account for, for mangroves? Do we count them under wetlands or do we count them under forests? Um, I'll talk about that in a second, but suffice to say that at this time, um, we account for them as forests because they meet the criteria as a forest. And in fact, we've always been reporting on mangroves as, as forests. We simply haven't, uh, until recently, had the guidance on how best to account for their uh, carbon stock change. Now, the 2013 supplement um, uh, came into effect uh, about 2014. That provided further guidance that expanded the uh, uh, chapter seven wetlands chapter in volume four. And um, as such, gave us uh, at the very least uh, some basic tier one um, guidance on how to account for carbon in uh, coastal wetland areas, and which included mangroves, but as well tidal marsh and seagrass meadows. And so we also had an extension of the activities that we might uh, look at under wetlands, uh, that, uh, which is under the 2006 guidelines, basically it's mostly about peat, extra peat extraction, which there is very little of in Australia. In fact, there's none at this time, except for uh, a minor cottage industry in uh, Tasmania was related to the production of uh, whiskey. Um, activities that promote emissions or removals uh, that we looked at included forest management, extraction, uh, excavation, drainage, rewetting, revegetation creation, and rewetted re soils. And I'll go through some of that uh, a little bit later. So, <clears throat> to get an idea as to what that expanded um, uh, activity might look like in our current accounts. The things that you see in red on this particular slide are the things that I currently account for in, uh, uh, with the um, expansion of uh, coastal wetlands into, into our UNFCCC accounting. Now understand that there's there's only a subset of this that actually goes into under KP, and that's um, because um, our uh, under KP, the only things that we are reporting on uh, that is relevant here are the mangroves themselves. Uh, tidal marsh and seagrass at this point um, are not included under KP accounting. Let me just jump in for those who don't understand what KPE is. He's talking about Kyoto Protocol. Yeah, Kyoto right? Protocol. But my my of, apologies. Yeah, no problem. Most of our countries are non-Annex 1, so yeah. Kyoto Protocol yeah. is something that they're not very familiar with. Yeah, yes. thank you, Churchill. And, and, and it's, it's important to also understand that um, from the nationally determined contributions, it's, KP, it's the Kyoto Protocol accounts that are actually the important ones. Okay. UNFCCC is a, is a captures everything as much as we can, but for the NDCs, uh, it's the KP protocol. Okay, so I wanted to answer this particular question that you had, Rosa, right at the very beginning, because there are numerous ways that you can actually um, go about this. And I, I share the pain of people try, uh, trying to get an um, traction with respect to how do you apply 2006 guidelines? And then on top of that, you've got the 2013 supplement and how do they interact? 
Well, the supplement, as I said, is an extension, uh, a voluntary extension, I would add, uh, for Annex 1 countries. Um, that uh, we've decided to apply in, uh, progressively over time. And so um, I'm currently working solely on chapter four, coastal wetlands. And in that, there are only a number of things that I currently, uh, that I currently account for with respect to, to chapter four. But perhaps when reading through the guidance in the, the supplement, you come across the first paragraph in the, the overview, the very beginning of, uh, of the supplement, that basically says, what's the coverage of the wetland supplement? When you pull that apart, it effectively says um, under uh, sentence four, land use category under which land is reported depends on national land use uh, category definitions, data collection systems, and tracking of land transitions. Effectively, you make the decision as to where you want to report um, uh, your carbon accounts, whether it be under uh, a wetlands land category or whether it be under forests. So in our case, in Australia's case, we uh, report on uh, mangrove, uh, any land use transitions, we report those under forest lands or um, conversions uh, to forest lands or conversions from forest lands to something else. The other issue that um, I've had long discussions with, uh, with respect to, with uh, colleagues in my department is uh, where does blue carbon actually fit in with respect to coastal wetlands? You have to look at the definitions uh, within uh, the 2030 supplement to understand that um, it is actually quite prescriptive. Coastal wetlands um, are affected by tidal water, whether that be fresh water, brackish or saline water, and they are areas vegetated by vascular plants. Now that has two important consequences for me as uh, the accountants, the carbon accountants, if you like, in that non-vascular plants, whether they be algae, um, macroalgae, microalgae, um, bacteria, um, the areas that are populated by that, for example, uh, tidal flats, which aren't vegetated, we don't account for those, we don't account for the carbon in those, even though they do actually contain a significant amount of carbon. Um, even though it might be less than you might find in the, vegetate, the, the, vas the vegetated parts of the intertidal zone. The soil um, still contains a reasonable amount of carbon. Um, and so I think that was an opportunity missed, but um, again, we have to work within the definitions that are provided. It also refers specifically to mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrass meadows. So that in dealing with blue carbon broadly uh, between uh, uh, departments, if you like, those members, those colleagues who are still in the Department of the Environment who are, look, who are um, looking after wetlands around Australia or looking after Ramsar, um, have also agreed that at this point we constrain ourselves uh, to mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrasses as being the representative habitats uh, under blue carbon that we can actually um, do some accounting with. So let's look at how we might estimate carbon stock change. And remember when doing an account, we are looking at um, the net impact of um, anthropogenic action on a, on a habitat and how that the net impact on the, on the uh, carbon stock in that habitat. And so what we report on, on a year to year basis, is how that carbon stock changes because of uh, some direct anthropogenic impact on that land. Now, in applying uh, guidance, 
I have to look through both the 2006 guidelines as well as the 2013 wetland supplement. Because the 2006 guidelines provides important information, definitional information, such as how to define your carbon pools, um, defines your land use and management categories. It, um, it tells you how to identify your key sources. That is, those um, habitats that are potential sources uh, of large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions or removals that will um, significantly impact uh, your um, account from year to year. Hershey's sorry, um, just to keep on time. You have 15 minutes, eh? So just to let yep, you know. Yep, that's all right. Yep. The, 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 so it's, it's those sorts of issues. You need to actually work across both um, the, the 2006 as well as the 2013 wetland supplement. I won't even talk about the refinement at this point in time, although I am actually applying it in other areas. So the current activities accounted for that involve Australian coastal wetlands are forest conversions, um, uh, which in 2006 guidance is forest conversions to grasslands, crops and settlements or wetlands. And in this particular case, the 2013 wetlands supplement provides me guidance on how to account for mangroves converted to settlements. Okay. And we look at direct emissions. I don't look at lagged emissions and I don't particularly look at uh, forest regrowth at this stage. Land converted to forests um, includes wetland, coastal wetlands converted to mangrove forest, which is effectively tidal marsh converted to mangrove forest, um, or uh, tidal flats converted to mangrove forest. And then we also have uh, environmental plantings uh, for mangroves, and I account for those things uh, in uh, the accounts currently. So the unit of activity that we, that we talk about is effectively um, the area of change where you observe change, whether it be a thinning of the canopy or it be a removal of the canopy or it be um, the introduction of a forest on what was previously um, tidal flat, for example. A good example of how we do that um, is looking at the development of uh, uh, com uh, well, commercial and uh, residential development on canal estates in an area very close to, uh, to my heart, Cleveland, an area where I lived for a time. Uh, in the 1980s, it was a lovely, Ravy Bay was a lovely little uh, bay with uh, mangrove, tidal marsh and seagrass. By the mid 80s through to currently, it's become this big development of canal estates, as you can see below. The way that we actually uh, uh, determine the areas of change is through the analysis of satellite imagery. And so uh, I've included the satellite images of, the, of, the, uh, of that area over those two time periods. And we, at this time, we're using uh, Landsat imagery as our major um, source of information. It's not to say that that's the only source because sometimes we cannot uh, determine uh, what is happening in other things such as tidal marsh or uh, seagrass meadows. So I use other sources of information to, uh, to look for impacts in the areas where there is likely development, such as around ports uh, and so on. The nice thing about satellite imagery is that you can build up a very good picture. Um, and this is from some work that was done by the uh, by Geoscience Australia in conjunction with uh, the an Australian National University, uh, University of New South Wales, um, on providing a timeline of uh, Australia's um, mangrove extent. Uh, from about 1985 uh, through to 19, uh, 2016. And this is just an example of some of the work that can be done by analysing Landsat imagery in terms of not only determining what the, what the extent is in an area, but also uh, have some idea as to the, um, the amount of 
a canopy cover that is available. Uh, this is very detailed work. Uh, what we tend to do uh, is to look at, for our purposes, we look at the extent only this time. So estimating carbon stock change, applying that guidance once you have an area. Um, I use a tier, uh, basically a combination of tier one and tier two approaches. So that um, tier three, uh, which is uh, the approach currently used in Australia for its terrestrial forests, is based on a uh, significant uh, uh, computer program called uh, Full Carbon Accounting Model, or Full CAN for short, that um, through a combination of empirical and numerical modeling, um, uh, can grow forests or can decay um, matter that has uh, from a forest that's been cleared over time. And so you, you can work out um, the emissions or the removals of carbon in an area uh, based on um, changes that you see over time. But I use a somewhat similar, simpler approach, um, mostly tier two uh, through uh, uh, developing a set, series of parameter values for, sim for simpler models that are based on the um, based on the models uh, or the guidance given through both the 2006 and the 2013 guidelines. <coughs> so to estimate carbon stock changes, we look at living biomass above and below ground, dead organic matter, which is which includes non-woody litter as well as dead wood, and soil organic carbon. So the, the basic equation for any one of those is the change in carbon is an emission factor by the area of that change. You determine that for each of the pools, you aggregate those pools, <coughs> and you get the, the change from year to year based on that simple equation. It's also worthwhile looking um, because one of the questions is, well, what is it um, that we should be modeling directly? It's worthwhile looking at the um, common report, uh, common format reporting tables, or common, sorry, reporting format tables that um, are used to, <coughs> pardon me, are used for, um, inputting your data uh, in through at UNFCCC. These tables give you an idea as to what your outputs should be that you should be reporting so that under UNFCCC um, you're looking at gains and losses in terms of your biomass, in terms of your soil and in terms um, of your dead organic matter. If you look at under the Kyoto Protocol, they like to have a little bit more disaggregation so that you're looking at above and below ground biomass at your dead wood and your non woody litter as well as your soil. So that from a modeling point of view, you really need, at, as a minimum, from Australia as an Annex 1 country, we need to um, develop models that provide us with changes in, in stock for above and below ground biomass, as well as the litter of dead wood and, and soil. So that um, we determine our areas uh, of change. Uh, for example, somebody's gone and removed a mangrove because they're putting in a port. Um, we see that change through the analysis of satellite imagery. Um, that analysis um, is based on the coastal tiles. Each of those, each of the tiles that you see um, here is effectively a, um, uh, an area, an image of a uh, Landsat image, well actually a, a composite image um, that we um, analyze 
on a year-to-year -year basis and note any changes that we see um, in the forest cover. We use a tier two approach. My models are spreadsheet based. I use Microsoft Excel, but any spreadsheet, uh, complex spreadsheet will be fine. And effectively, I apply the equation. Um, the change in carbon is the emission factor by area. The observed area is, uh, is from the satellite imagery and the emission factor is from uh, basic good science uh, reported in the literature uh, that I've uncovered over a period of time. The, now I've provided Rosa with the actual uh, spreadsheet uh, for this slide for anybody who wishes it, but this basically is a run through of what a model might look like. At the very top row, the SD54 refers to um, the uh, tile that you saw in the previous slide, which is where, if you like, the pixel location or the change in pixels is, uh, is observed. And then we look through different, the different uh, habitats that we might observe there and um, some of the conditions um, that you would require uh, to answer questions as to how the model would go progress forward. And, th and this particular sheet is, if you like, once you work your way through it, um, provides the logic under which the model works. And I can certainly uh, help people with that um, if they wish to contact me about it. For the growth model, um, I chose an equation for that simulated, <coughs> if you like, growth of the forest rather than growth of an individual tree. So the weights that you see are the weights of a particular species per hectare over time. Um, it's all explained here as to what that is. The mass, the weight is based on dry weight. And that provides you with a sigmoidal growth curve for which you have a minimum maximum extent or, or weight, <coughs> um, as well as the point in time when you have uh, maximum age, where the maximum mass is reached and the, and the age at which the forest is growing fastest. Now, that requires a significant amount of work to, um, and there's only a couple of examples of that work here in Australia. So my model is based on um, some work that was done in Western Australia. Um, and I, but unfortunately, because of lack of other data, I've applied that across Australia at this time. I'm hoping that uh, with time, I'll be able to modify this uh, to be more regionally based. Yep, sorry. Okay. Uh, you'll have five more minutes and we'll okay. open questions. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Sergio. Fine. Good. All right. Quick f a flash of um, the, uh, what the model looks like in, in the spreadsheet. Um, again, um, if people are interested, I can certainly talk about it. Unfortunately, I can't give away a copy of the model itself at this time. I uh, need uh, permission from my department to do that. Acquiring data for models. <clears throat> Ways to do that is to uh, look through the scientific literature, to uh, work with, I've worked with Australia's wetland scientists, um, ran a couple of workshops, um, and acquired a lot of data over time. We we're also very fortunate that at the time when I first started, was the end of a research project um, by the CSIRO in Australia. Uh, they formed a marine and coastal carbon bio biogeochemistry cluster, who and they, in conjunction with a number of universities, uh, went around Australia and effectively um, uh, examined how carbon varied between um, habitats and climate zones around the Australian coastline. And, uh, a recent pub, uh, summary of that work was published as uh, references below. 
um, as well as a number of other publications that have come out of that recently. So very quickly, if you wish to go through with this, um, I found the best way to do is establish a, a framework to guide further work, um, establish the activities you want to report on, what activity data is available, how it is to be collected, and establish where you want to actually report it in which land use category. Review your own in-country data to establish where possible your, um, uh, your own EF and parameter values for your, for your modeling and look for additional data sources to fill gaps. And that means working with other countries. I've used information from New Zealand because their work on temperate mangroves is actually first class and exceeds what we've done here in Australia. Um, from that, you can develop where you think your, your tier level model is possible and what is required. Because if you, if you find that you're looking at a key category uh, from an Annex 1 country point of view, um, we need to use a higher tier model. We can't just use a tier one model. And then to develop your model. The major learning from this in the spreadsheet models is that it's difficult to maintain a consistent representation of lands using approaches two or three. Now, what that effectively means is I have two models. One's for mangrove growth, one is for mangrove excavation. They are blind to one another. They can't you might have an area where you have growth over one decade, but in the next decade, you might have had a removal. I'd be recording the growth in one model and continuing on that growth through the following decade because uh, growth occurs over three decades for a forest, but not knowing that um, the half of that forest was removed 10 years down the track. So, Using a spreadsheet model, it's difficult. Um, I'm currently working to move the models into the tier three uh, full cam model here in Australia. And that will um, overcome that particular problem because that particular model um, does account for changes over time. Government buying is absolutely important. Um, from Australia's point of view, we've accepted voluntary inclusion of, of at least some of the uh, 2013 wetland supplement. As I said, I'm currently working on chapter four. I'll be working on other chapters as I go forward um, uh, because they'll be required, uh, particularly under the uh, uh, 2019 um, revision. And the other thing is that if there is something, another part of the department, which is our uh, uh, emissions reductions fund, are very interested in blue carbon because blue carbons represent uh, very good sinks. And if you can continue to develop, uh, well, for one thing, you want to avoid uh, destroying your, your uh, blue carbon sinks because they'll become uh, great emitters. But the other thing is, uh, the blue cut the environmental emissions reduction fund is there to provide funds to industry to undertake projects to reduce um, their emissions or to mitigate their emissions through uh, establishing uh, things like uh, new mangroves um, reducing uh, one of the things we're looking at is to reduce coastal bums, uh, which keep tidal water out of um, uh, coastal wetland areas and convert and has in the past converted those to wetland pasture, freshwater wetland pasture, which are great methane emitters to remove those bums to real to allow the uh, reintroduction of tidal flow and convert those back into uh, uh, saline wetlands to reduce methane. Those sorts of things uh, have spurred uh, the, uh, the government to have a positive approach with respect to blue carbon. And one of the best things that you can do is to undertake UNFCCC training programs. Um, 
my my understanding of the accounts and how to how to manage modeling under the accounts uh, was greatly aided by uh, some of the training programs that I've undertaken and some of the third party training courses that are currently available through the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute are also excellent places to uh, to undertake training. So if you have, if there's confusion about how it all fits together, um, training, these training programs uh, will help significantly. When I was in America, um, that's what I saw a lot of. Where I currently live, it's as cold, but we just don't have that snow. So I'm very happy. Thanks very much. I thought that could not be Australia, even though you said that this morning you were two degrees Celsius. So I, I think Australia definitely can, can be very cold. Thank you so much for this extremely interesting um, chat. Uh, there is a lot of information to digest, so we are so yes. uh, grateful. Yeah, absolutely. There is. Uh, we will be sharing this slide so people and the audience and the governments can take a look more quietly to that. And we're going to open the uh, panel for everyone to ask you questions. But uh, while they're is writing their questions in their chat, so I'm, I'm, I'm calling the audience to include their questions, especially for the governments. Uh, let me ask you two questions. Um, sure. You were mentioning, you have this slide that you were showing, the, one, the, the um, activities that you were counting and mm -hmm. those that you were not. So maybe that something you could explain why do you use some activities and not the others and particularly you are accounting uh, mangrove growth but you are not accounting forest regrowth so the yeah. expansion of new yeah. areas of mangrove doesn't seem to be yeah. accounted so, so why would you do that and also before that <laughs> before sure. you answer the second question would be about soils i think countries in the region more yep. or less can figure out with tier one how to do the above round but mm -hmm. their problems are soils. Soils, um, yeah. CO2, but also methane. So maybe these two questions on my side. Thank you. Yeah, no, sure. So um, the activities ba are based on what we see most of. Um, first of all, because we're looking at uh, changes due to direct anthropogenic impacts. So the two anthropogenic impacts are either we remove a mangrove uh, because, we're, because of some development, or we grow a mangrove because we have an, off, an environmental offset somewhere um, where we remove mangrove here, but you know what, we'll, we've established an, uh, a new intertidal area over there. So we'll plant some mangroves over in that area to compensate. And so those are two, um, two activities that I can uh, account for. Um, in terms of regrowth, this comes back down to my being a little bit blind as to what happens um, uh, to an area. Regrowth effectively means an area that was previously cleared of mangrove has naturally, naturally or otherwise um, got new mangrove on it. So I don't see that specific activity yet. When I move into full cam, that will become an activity that will actually be um, be accounted for. It's it's simply a uh, a restriction of the type of modelling that you do. Tier one and tier two models, um, and, and the trouble is, you know, Australia being so large, we have we just simply don't um, have the capacity to uh, do the field surveys that would be required to to effectively yeah. monitor that. So we do it through satellite imagery and, and that that is great, but, um, and we spend a lot of dollars to, to do that because it requires a whole team of people to uh, effectively analyze differences, year to year differences and see that a change pixel, that is where you, and a change is observed in the, in the canopy, forest canopy, whether A, it is real and not an artifact, but real, and B, to then um, ascribe it to either a natural event where, and that the 7,000 hectares lost in the Gulf of Carpentaria is a natural event. Um, well, not ascribed to, to direct human, uh, human interference in those 
in those mangroves as against a, an anthropogenic event where somebody's come in and um, either grown a mangrove or, or removed a mangrove. So, um, Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. soil. And yeah, soil. soil. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the way that I work the models is that um, it relies on data uh, from scientific studies on the soil content, on the carbon content in the top metre of soil in sediments around Australia. Um, the, that carbon cluster that I spoke about did a lot of that work. Okay, and um, I am the beneficiary of that. Where um, a party can't actually, or hasn't got that data, they may have to rely on data from areas that are similar in, in, uh, in habitat, where the work has been done, in, in, perhaps from another party, or you have to rely on the default values that are provided in the, in the guidance. But you will have some starting points, and the whole the whole purpose of um, or, or the whole direction of the accounts is one of continuous improvement going forward. You may not start with an account that is entirely accurate, but accuracy will improve over time, and that's what you aim for. You yeah, thank you, you. You don't need to actually put it all together in one go. Absolutely, this progressive approach is extremely important. I will come back to the topic of soil, yep. but let me first ask you something from uh, a government. They, um, uh, the, one of the governments in the region is asking, um, in one of your slides, you mentioned that mangrove forest um, is what you are focusing on. And the question is, what do you consider mangrove forest when estimating biomass? Only mangroves or forests predominantly with mangroves? And the yeah, person is asking no. this because they have this yeah. discussion of whether to incorporate other uh, like participating yeah. species or not. Yeah, yeah. so um, effectively you use the, um, uh, the definition of forest that is in the 2006 guidance. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly broad definition. Um, so. Um, in the sense that, from Australia's point of view, uh, we look at um, a canopy cover of, uh, of about 20% or more with a height of about two metres plus, okay? That, that could be considered, if you like, forest under the definition. So any mangrove that is out there that looks that matches that particular definition will be considered forest. We have, we, we extend it a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, for plantations, when you first plant your plantation, your forest plantation, um, obviously your saplings aren't two metres high and, you, and you're not going to see uh, your canopy cover at that particular point in time. If we know that something's been planted and it's forest, um, then that becomes a forest because it's potentially will be a forest within the next five years. Tertia, sorry to interrupt, but the question goes to species. So I think that- Oh, to species. Yeah, yeah it's no, not... it's species, species. Uh, if it's a tree, if it's a tree in that, that comprises the, the, uh, the forest, then it's the habitat rather than just the species. Okay, it's so uh, it will we go in. Yeah. It will go in. Okay. It will go in. Yeah. 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 So so government of Guyana, I think this question is Guyana. Uh yes, you incorporate there uh the forest as as, as Tertius was saying. So, yeah. so you'll find that the uh, carbon content in soils is different between mangroves, uh tidal marsh and, and uh unvegetated areas anyway. Um and so when, you, when you're reporting uh, or doing your modeling, you will have different uh, uh, values for your soil carbon for those, for those habitats, uh, and uh, whether it be seagrass or tidal marsh or, or mangrove, uh, which just reflects 
um, the conditions uh, for those habitats. Um, so when, in a reporting sense, mangroves can be reported, it depends totally up to the country, as I said before, can be reported on the wetlands if you wish to, uh, on the coastal wetlands, or it can be reported on the, on the forests because mangrove forests do meet the definition of forest uh, in the 2006 guideline, guidelines. Um, so I guess answering the government, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I think answering the government of Mexico, then yes, you can use the wetland supplement, but then put those data yeah. under the, the yeah, forest exactly. land category. Exactly. That, that, that's exactly what I've done. I've, I've used the wetland supplement to uh, better characterize um, mangrove forest and, as distinct from terrestrial forest, because effectively mangrove forests um, sequester much more carbon than exactly. Australia's terrestrial forests do. Exactly. On, exactly. A, on a per hectare basis. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're going to give um, now the floor to Keen, but before well, from the government of Guyana. But before we do that, um, Tertius. One of the issues that we saw in our first session is that incorporating a blue carbon as part of the NDCs in non-Annex 1 countries requires to have mangroves within red class. So the mitigation targets that have been, there is not a blue carbon Barso framework for, 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 for the mangroves and it has to then be connected to the frails and the ethereals that countries have. So, and that added a lot of complications, like having just one line of reporting for mangroves when they are already accounted within red, or even if they are not accounted, but they are occupying areas that have been reported within yep. the frails are very, it's very complicated. So the option two is that for NDCs, countries in the region could use their greenhouse gas national inventories and then create this uh, reporting uh, categories for mangroves. So having exactly what uh, the government of Australia is doing. So you have your blue carbon within the national greenhouse gas communication. Um, but the tricky part here and the question for you is because uh, you, you you basically probably also have uh, mangroves under Kyoto and then you use the Kyoto commitments for the mm -hmm. NDCs. So basically that in the, if we translate that to the non-annex one, that is like saying you have already your commitments under red and then you put the reds into the NDCs. So uh, it, it is a bit tricky for countries that wanted to have their NDCs with blue carbon as a, as a self-standing line of reporting out of the red class. Mm -hmm. I would say the only or the easiest way right now would be to have them reporting that under their greenhouse gas inventory. So create this line of reporting that is specifically for blue carbon. Any tip you can then give on, on these? How could they use their greenhouse gas inventories uh, and, and their subcategories of, of mangroves as a way to then create mitigation targets under NDCs? It's a ah. tricky question, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's a very tricky question. Not not one that I'm actually uh, very familiar with. Um, okay. In in terms of, you know, because <laughs> the only thing I've worked with um, is basically uh, preparing the reports for UNFCCC and and the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Um, Let me ask you then an easier question, and we'll move to Guyana. What difference is the reporting that you have in Kyoto for blue carbon? And then the, the commitment for, for mangrove that you have under Kyoto, and then the accounting that you also include in the greenhouse gas communication. Does that match exactly? No, um, so for, for mangroves it does. Um, but of course, under UNFCCC, I also then report um, uh, changes to seagrass and uh, tidal marsh habitats, which I don't report to, which I don't report under Kyoto. So, um, yeah, it's, mangroves, as I said, has always been reported uh, simply because they were forests captured in satellite imagery. And we've simply, um, uh, resolved uh, a better carbon accounting for, for that, type of forest um, and so and so it goes forward from there 
Um, how we go for, forward under Paris, um, I'm not sure at this point. So okay, that's, 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 that's fair question. enough. That's fair enough. It's not an easy question, eh? No. Um, okay. Um, there was some discussion on the on the um, chat about the definition of forest, answering a bit uh, Guyana, um, but we're going to move ahead um, to have. Uh, the Guyana government, sure. thank you so much, Tertius. Thank you very, very much. This is extremely useful. Um, Australia is very advanced. They have tier three modeling, as you could see. So uh, most of our regional governments are working on tier one and using default values, but Australia already goes into the mm. entire modeling approach, tier three, both for growth and for soil. So, so it, is, um, it is top level. But I think your slides are going to be extremely important for the, also the countries to see which type of soil emissions Australia is uh, uh, accounting into their system, yeah, which you so. highlighted in red color. So thank you so much also for sharing these slides. And uh, thank you for offering. Thank you also, Sturgeon, for offering some support if some countries might want to ask you further questions. Yes, um, pleasure. Uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to respond. Thank you very questions. much. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Let me share the screen yes. and I'm going to give floor then to Kin, uh, mostly Boston. Uh, we have the, we are very grateful that we have here today with us. Um, sorry. Kin is the coordinator of the mangrove restoration and management department at Guyana's National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute, the NARA. And the overall objective of this institution, uh, Institute and Array, is to respond uh, to climate change and mitigate its effect through the protection, restoration, conservation, and management of Guyana's coastal mangrove ecosystem. And uh, today, Kin uh, will be talking about lessons learned and experiences that Guyana has on submitting uh, mangrove and coastal ecosystems related projects to the um, Global Environmental Fund and the uh, Green uh, Climate Fund. So, Keen, very warm welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so, my presentation um, is going to focus um, more in general on how we have been able to mobilize finance mangrove restoration and management in um, Guyana. So briefly, I'm going to give an uh, overview of the country profile, how we, the mangrove restoration um, program has evolved in Guyana over the years, areas that have been implemented and what has been some of our experiences, and then go through how we have financed restoration and um, protection in initiatives, sources of financing, and what are some of the funding opportunities and the challenges that we've had. So Guyana is, us, is in South America. We have a very small population. 90% of that population is concentrated along the coast. So it's a very coastal population. And we have no natural disasters. But we are vulnerable because we have a low-lying coastline, about 1.8 meters below sea level. So we have need for uh, coastal protection. And most of that coastal protection is through uh, mangrove ecosystems and hard structures such as uh, seawalls. The mangrove ecosystem is um, low. The current coverage is just about 33,000 hectares. It's fringe mangroves with the Avencina bordering the coastline. We have three species, Avencina, Rhizophora mangal, and the Lagunculae racemosa. And those, our ecosystem, because of the fact that we're on the Norbazil shelf, large marine ecosystem, um, it's subject to natural coastal uh, erosion and accretion cycles. With regards to resources, uh, we are agriculture country. We have forestry resources and a very recent, we are currently um, investing in our recent oil finds and we also have mineral resources available. So how has the mangrove restoration program evolved in Guyana? It started in 2010 with the Guyana Mangrove Restoration Project. 
And at the same time, uh, mangroves were declared a protected species in Guyana or on, under the Forest Act. During the implementation of the project, we established a National Mangrove Management Action Plan that uh, moved from 2000, was implemented during 2010 to 2012. And we were also able to get technical assistance through the uh, European Union funded project that saw Lands Mills providing technical assistance with fielding of mangrove experts, as well as um, engineers to provide support as we had not undertaken a restoration initiative of this scale before in the country. At the end of the restoration project itself in 2013, the Mango Restoration and Management Department was established within the National Agricultural Research and Extension Institute. And that is where uh, we are presently implementing the activities and lessons learned um, during the project. So under the project, which is funded by the government of Ghana and the European Union, um, we looked at a number of areas, not just the restoration of degraded areas, but we also collaborated with the University of Ghana to conduct research on, um, on Ghana's mangroves. We also looked at increases public awareness and education about the importance of mangroves so that we can get community buy-in. And we looked at small livelihood projects that can be tied to the mangroves that will allow communities to earn an income by protecting and restoring their mangrove ecosystem. So just to give a, a brief on what we have been, some of the projects that we've implemented with regards to restoration, all of which was um, based on the public awareness and education um, as a background and ongoing research. We have done significant work with regards to establishing engineering structures, sediment traps, geotextile tools in areas where the shoreline did not meet sufficient criteria for mangroves to be established. And where we would have done that, we have supplement that, supplemented that work with planting spartan grasses at those locations. And areas where we, our assessment indicated that the conditions were suitable, we did mangrove seedling plantations uh, with community support. So all of our seedling plantations, the nurseries for those plantations um, were community nurseries, were trained and paid persons in the communities to establish the nurseries. And then we paid them to plant the seedlings um, when they reach the appropriate stage. We had one prior project at hydrological restoration. And the reason we had these, you know, these several different types of interventions is that during our technical assistance support that we received, um, we uh, adopted the program of assessing what is happening at the site first and then going through the various interventions to see why mangroves are not there and what is the most appropriate intervention that needs to be established to reestablish the mangrove ecosystem. So we've had a number of successes with regards to our uh, seeding plantations. We've established over, restored over 300 hectares of mangroves along the coast. We have natural colonization of the mangrove seedlings in areas where we would have implemented the geotextile to groins as the appropriate intervention or the sediment traps or bamboo brush with dams as we call them. And we also have rapid colonization of the spartina that has was transplanted from one region to the other. So how did we finance these restoration initiatives? A significant portion, uh, about 80% of the finance for some public funds from the government of Guyana as they would have committed to mangrove restoration um, activities. And then we also had a significant portion of that from international donors, primarily the European Union. Small projects funded by multilaterals, and I'm going to go into uh, what some of those projects were. And then we had funding as well from conservation organizations. The government of Guyana funding um, was primarily for capital projects. As I indicated, the Mango Restoration Department is now uh, 
Department of NARI. So we have annual budgeting as part of NARI's annual preparation of annual budgets, and we also have a capital budget. And those projects fund the capital projects, restoration activities. It also funds research, monitoring, and our public waste and education program. The international um, donor funds we receive us through the European Union GCCA budget, um, budget support, and the 11th EDF, which the GCCA program funded the initial mango restoration project, as well as technical assistance. Uh, we're currently um, receiving funding for technical assistance under the 11th EDF to establish some of those um, capital projects, as well as look to establish mango reserves as part of the performance criteria on the agreement for the 11th year. There's the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives that would have provided funding for um, livelihood, a livelihood initiative for persons who are involved in apiculture in mangroves. And that, provide, that fund provided for um, PPEs as well as training for persons within the communities to establish apiaries within mangrove areas. With regards to multilaterals, um, the GEF through its um, international waters last year funded the North Brazil Shelf uh, Mangrove Project, which was implemented by Conservation International. And that project uh, was a one year project that provided critical research information as well as updating of the Ghana uh, mango forest cover. The Jeff Small Grants Program um, in Guyana funded uh, one restoration project through a local NGO uh, with NARI's participation and technical input. And that also allowed for the restoration of um, one site as well as um, training of persons and public education. Conservation organization, we would have successfully prepared proposals and received funding from WWF Education for Nature, the restoration grant where we provided technical assistance for a local NGO to prepare that proposal and receive funding for the restoration of the site, as well as we receive funding from the workshop grant to provide education and awareness and train persons with regards to mangrove restoration and management. At the moment, um, we're receiving technical assistance through Severe Amazonia and NASA for a capacity building workshop that is looking to establish a mangrove monitoring system utilizing remote sensing and uh, satellite imagery. And then as well on the, um, this area, we, the livelihood program had received um, funding from CATS. That program provided um, funding for training in tourism. We have a pilot project that looked at conservation tours with in a mangrove area, train, um, educating persons about the importance of mangroves, while at the same time, um, it's tied to the history of one of the first villages bought by freed slaves in them. So as part of the livelihood program, it's not just um, the agriculture that we looked at, but we also looked at a tourism livelihood project. There are a number of funding opportunities that are currently in the pipeline, and there are a number of future opportunities that we're looking at. For the, the second phase of the NBS mangrove project that was funded by Jeff, and Conservation International is currently looking at what that project would fund coming out of the first phase and the recommendations that were made. The European Union um, on the 11th EDF, has already prepared an action that is looking to support, titled is to support again as nature-based responses to global climate change. And that is expected to um, commence in 2021. The, the Conservation International Guyana has an agreement with Exxon for the Exxon Guyana Resilience and One project. 
And that project is a five-year project that is especially to contribute to a green economy and enhance Ghana's natural and cultural heritage. And as part of that project, um, the coastal mangrove ecosystem is expected to receive funding for green gray infrastructure projects, as well as updating our national mangrove management action plan. With regards to future opportunities, we have had some initial discussions with some of the oil and gas support companies that are currently in Guyana that are looking to invest in mangrove restoration and protection initiatives. Um, primarily, they have expressed an interest that um, in investing in these initiatives, they would like to be able to claim the carbon credits. Although at the moment, we have not done significant work with regards to um, registering uh, our mangrove restoration activities uh, for carbon credits. With regards to uh, multilateral, as um, Rosemary indicated, we have submitted uh, two project proposals to the GCF for funding. Um, these have not been uh, approved. So one has been submitted through five Cs that is looking to enhance, sorry, coast, enhancing coastal protection for climate change resilience. And one submitted through Conservation International that is looking at the potential of Ghana's inland and mangrove forests to further reduce emissions and build resistance to climate change. While these project proposals have been prepared and submitted to the GCF, um, they have not been approved yet and are currently going through the process. Let me jump in because there are a lot of acronyms here. For those of you in the region, the triple five C, sorry, the, 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 the five C's is this Caribbean Climate Change Community Center. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, and also for those of you who are not um, a very uh, used to it, MBS is nature-based solutions, which is the use of mangroves as green infrastructure, and the use of mangroves in general as, as uh, ecosystem services, just, just to clarify. And then the EDF is the European um, yeah, Development well. Fund. Yeah, exactly. Perfect, thank you. Well, these, are, these are amazing slides. Thank you, uh, Kim. Go ahead. Yes, um, the MBS we're referring to is the North Brazil self Lies Marine Ecosystem. Because the projects, um, that project looks at not Ghana alone, but um, Ghana and Suriname. Oh, sorry. Perfect. So MBS here, the second phase MBS, it's the uh, North Basin. Uh, North Basin. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Perfect. Th thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. As we are on um, the NBS Mangrove project, the official name for the project um, is quite long, <laughs> so we usually use that. Um, there, that project did a number of studies, and one of the, those studies um, conducted by Silverstrom Climate Associates, and I noticed uh, Steve Brooks is part of this uh, webinar. So his team at Silver Surround Climate so we conducted the Blue Carbon Feasibility Assessment as part of that project in 2019. And while they did not use in-country data, they valued the carbon storage for Guyana at 700 million. And um, they value based on coastal resilience benefits because as I mentioned, the project was Guyana and Suriname was 1100 million in Suriname. And the value based on the potential cost savings um, by replacing man-made structures. While this is not possible um, to replace the manual stru man-made structures in Guyana, uh, was estimated at 1.5 to 3.6 um, billion dollars. So, as I indicated, while this assessment um, was not done using in-country data, one of the recommendations um, coming out of it is to be able to do that um, data collection and assessment to get in country values. Uh, in addition to that, um, the project also had a consultancy done that um, looked at financing, um, conduct a strategic assessment of financing me potential uh, mechanisms available um, to CI, and they recommended a, a hybrid approach that looked at diversifying the, the financial uh, portfolio, not looking at carbon offsets, um, oil funds, 
um, in Guyana and Suriname, corporate partnerships, uh, green bonds, and um, community engagements. So what are some of the challenges that uh, we have with regards to mobilizing finance? Well, one of the things that we start is that at the moment in Guyana, there's um, no policy on, on ice integrated coastal zone management and mangrove conservation. And I was happy to learn at the meeting um, this morning that the Office of Climate Change in Guyana will be looking at a establishing a policy with regards to our coastal zone. So this particular challenge um, hopefully will be shortly overcome. There's a lack of coordination across um, coastal regulatory bodies. The organizations that are, organizations that are responsible for mangrove management and conservation in Guyana is spread across a number of different agencies. While uh, the National Agriculture Research and Extension Institute at the moment is the agency that is leading the restoration activities with regards to mangroves. The agency does not have a legislative mandate with regards to mangroves. The legislative mandate comes under the Guyana Forestry Commission. Um, part of it is under the CM River Defense Division, the Environmental Protection Agency, and a number of other agencies um, so that there is no need to be able to coordinate um, the activities of these agencies. and um, our data and human capacity. As I indicated, the work that was done under the MBS project with regards to um, blue carbon assessment was not done using um, our in-country data. So there is need for a carbon assessment using in-country data, um, gathering data on species and stock, Monitoring um, through that severe Amazonian NASA project, we're hoping to make headway with regards to our monitoring program. Our monitoring right now is primarily focused on our restoration initiatives, and that is um, field monitoring um, to do an assessment of the success of our restoration activities. So the monitoring that we need to move um, to is doing an annual assessment of our mangrove cover changes and so forth and implementing adaptive management. So that's briefly my presentation. Um, I trust that I was able to provide an overview of what we've been doing in Guyana, how we've been able to finance those restoration activities and uh, what some of the challenges that we are we would have experienced and how we plan to move forward. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Keen. I I truly enjoyed uh, your presentation. All these different type of sources of funding and and the type of activities that you're also promoting um, as, as coastal protection. And thank you. I think that was really really enlightening. Let me open the floor now for governments in the region to ask you questions and some of them will probably overlap with the uh, presentation by Mark from the Green Climate Fund on what are the type of lessons learned of how to uh, improve the competitiveness, competitiveness so that the projects finally get funded I guess. So um, maybe that will be my question to you while we open the chat and, and the audience can ask, ask questions about uh, what would be your suggestions from your experiences uh, in Guyana in terms of both for the GEF and uh, Green Environmental Fund and the, um, um, and the GCF, what are, in your opinion, some of the tips that you could give these governments to have successful programs? Is co-funding, it is having already existing policies, is having a clear vision, is having clear targets? What do you think would be some of these requirements? Um, well, definitely having a clear vision of um, what is it you want to have funded. Um, for us, I think one of the challenges as well uh, was with regards to data and um, having the available data that is required to um, be part of these uh, project proposals. And at the moment, we are working to overcome the challenge with regards to in-country capacity to prepare these project proposals. 
Um, so I know a number of agencies within the Ministry of Agriculture, um, NARI included, are participating in a capacity building project to prepare concept notes for Green Climate Fund. navigation for other countries in the region. Thank you so much for, for sharing these lessons learned. I think this is extremely useful. Um, let me give two more minutes for someone other countries to ask something. In the meantime, otherwise Mark is going to start to get ready. Also, um, while Mark starts getting ready, uh, um, Guyana, let me ask you also something. Um, in terms of this international, as, as we saw, there are different types of, of finance, like from private sector to um, interactions uh, with aid agencies and bilateral. But from this big um, funding bodies, GEF and Green Climate Fund, uh, your experience has been more successful uh, with GEF than with the GCF, or, or, or the timing has been different. So is, is there any suggestion? between these two that you might want to make in terms of how to be more competitive. And then we'll give the, the, uh, the stick to, uh, to Mark. He is the one who will also let us know what would be the good tips to have more competitive proposals. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, Rosemi, you are addressing. I'm... I'm addressing, yeah, the question is, between the GEF, in your experience, mm -hmm. between the Global Environmental Fund and the um, Green Climate Fund, um, how which one has been more successful for you in terms of funding and, and what do you think could be the reason? Well, the, the GEF would have been more successful because we actually got the funding and the projects implemented. Exactly. Um, the applications for those projects, um, so for instance, the, the GEF International Waters um, funding I received, the application went through Conservation International and I think the, the approach that they use with regards to the preparation of the project proposal and including our stakeholders and getting an idea from the countries Ghana and Suriname what were our objectives and uh, what we would like to get out of the um, projects was key. Um, with regards to the GCF projects, um, while I haven't been actively involved with regards to the feedback from GCF on uh, what has been the issue, with those projects. I know that um, the data availability um, has been one of the areas where we've been challenging Guyana. Great, great. Th this is extremely um, useful. We are going to open the chat right now so that whomever has questions, uh, both for Keen or for Mark, can start writing them in the chat so that we will speed up a bit the process. Uh, so, Kim, thank you so much. I am very impressed with the um, with the activities, the sources, the uh, the type of, of vision that Guyana has on, on coastal protection and the role of mangroves and other coastal ecosystems. Thank you so much for sharing this. The slides will also thank you, thank you very much. The slides will be shared with the other with the audience, so also people can digest a lot uh, a bit more quietly this this great information. Um, and now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mark Dumas Johansen. Um, besides being an old friend from FAO Time, um, Mark is the forest and land use specialist in the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation at the Green Climate Fund. So, some of the questions that we were uh, right now opening, he would be um, able perhaps to give us some uh, tips on, on how countries can. Uh, try to unlock a bit of finance for, for green, uh, for blue carbon action. Uh, Mark leads and coordinates the review of forest and land use related projects uh, from project idea to full funding proposals presenting to the Green Climate Fund Board for approval. So he is our man uh, for giving us some, some tips on, on how to have um, more competitive uh, proposals. He's currently coordinating the development of guidelines for the Green Climate Fund Forest and Land Use Sector and also for a large um, scale umbrella program on the Great uh, Green Wall. Uh, he's a Danish and French citizen with Vietnamese roots, so he's rather international, and he started his career in Cambodia and Vietnam working on agriculture development. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here. The floor 
chance is yours. Thank you very much, Rosa, and, and thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for this opportunity to uh, be here with you today and to have this great opportunity to discuss and to hopefully try to answer some of your questions. I, I may not be able to answer all of them, but, uh, but, but, but very happy to engage with you and, of course, continue our discussion uh, after this webinar as well. And, and please feel free to reach out to me anytime uh, afterwards so, so we can continue these uh, discussions. Um, I'll quickly upload my my slide it's here yeah perfect thank you mark um i hope you're all able to to see this yes all right great so um the uh, slides are prepared today are just a quick overview of of the green climate fund you may all all be very familiar with that so it's just a quick summary then a brief introduction to some of the um, projects that we have that touch on blue carbon we don't have uh, many uh, we, you know, would like to have many more, of course, and so, so looking very much forward to also hear your ideas um, on on how we could have more of that, and then finally a bit of tip, tips uh, from my side, uh, what what could be good to include in the uh, the overall concept notes that that you will be submitting to us, and also um, touching briefly on the uh, current work we have on the sector guidance, uh, which I will um, explain a bit further in the presentation. Very briefly, um, the Green Climate Fund is a fairly new, um, fairly new donor. Or, um, we were established uh, back in 2010 um, at the 16th conference of the parties. Uh, we are part of the key uh, finance mechanism of the UNFCCC. Um, we have since 2013 um, been located and headquartered in South Korea. Uh, the overall objective we have um, is to promote a paradigm shift towards low emission and climate resilient development pathways. Um, the way we operate is we work through partnerships uh, at the country level with our national designated authorities, our focal points, and then through a wide range of uh, accredited entities that can be both uh, national direct entities in the countries, they can be private sector, and they can also be international uh, entities such as uh, UN entities. Uh, currently we are around 90, I think 90 accredited entities, and it keeps growing uh, as, as more and more have, uh, have an interest in, in working with us. Uh, we offer also quite a wide uh, variety of financial instruments from uh, grants, loans, uh, guarantees, and equity. Um, as I mentioned, it's very country driven, so we are also working with countries and the NDAs to uh, develop uh, country programs that uh, align the priorities of the countries uh, of, of the type of projects and ambition that the countries would, would like to see, where after the accredited entities then work together with the countries to finalize those ideas and, and turning them into a, a concept note. Um, what is it that we look for in projects? And I'll come, come back to some of these key things on this slide. Um, well, basically, um, starting with um, the eight result areas you have here. We have um, four on the mitigation side. You'll see them in the top here and then four on the adaptation. Of course, many of them are cross-cutting, you know, for example, in the result area that I work in, in, in forest and land use, many of our projects uh, are not only mitigation, but, but also have some, some adaptation aspects, of course. Uh, in particular, I work a lot with projects that, that combine the ecosystems. You'll see down in the, in the bottom left corner, which is on the adaptation side, where, where, where we currently have most of our uh, mangrove focus, for example, and, and potentially, in the future would have more uh, on, on blue carbon combining the forest and land use and the ecosystem result areas. Um, but the reason I'm mentioning this is that get, based on the result area that you would focus on, uh, that would determine the, the, the paradigm shift that, that you would like to, to achieve. And also it will uh, impact the, the type of the activities of course and the overall nature of the project that you, that, that you would be submitting. Um, but, but in general, for all projects, is the additionality of the GCF funding. So, first of all, why, why the GCF? Um, what is already happening on the ground? Is, is the GCF project able to scale that up um, to, 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 to the entire country or to parts of the country or to other countries? And also the opportunity to crowd in uh, additional finance, so basically co-finance. Uh, we don't have a strict um, number on, on co-finance, what it has to be, but it's always good to 
to indicate the potential for co-finance and also what can be leveraged by the project in terms of, for example, private sector finance. Um, we have also, um, of course, being a climate fund, it has to be a climate project. Uh, so to have a very strong climate rationale is, is, is very, very key. We see that for uh, projects that are being assessed by our, our independent uh, technical advisory panel and by the board, that for the adaptation projects alone, and this sometimes is is uh, quite challenging, but for cross-cutting projects where we where we have uh, forest and land use, for example, and, and ecosystems, it's it's more uh, let's say easier to justify the climate rationale. But for for adaptation alone, it requires quite a lot of data, and and quite a lot of information. Um, we we have um, also, of course, uh, you will see down here on these uh, our investment criteria. Um, really, the important thing here is to, to highlight how the project is, is aligned to those six investment criteria. In particular, three of them are, are of importance is the impact potential. So, uh, how many uh, tons of emission reductions uh, will we be able to achieve? How many um, direct beneficiaries can we, can we change the livelihood of and, and make it more sustainable? Then the paradigm shift. What is it really that the project can help transform? And what is the long-term aspect of that uh, transformation and, and how is that sustainable? Also linking that to the exit strategy. What will happen after our funding uh, stops? How can the project continue to develop and to be scaled up over time? And uh, finally, on efficiency and effectiveness, looking at the um, uh, potential to leverage additional finance, for example, and to keep that as an effective part of the uh, project. Um, so basically, as I mentioned, we, we, we have um, very limited projects at the moment worldwide on blue carbon. Um, it's some, not something we, we are happy with. Of course, we would like to have more projects. And, and I'll come back to uh, one active thing we are doing now to, to increase this. Um, but this list is uh, not a, an, uh, an exclusive list. It's just a brief overview of some of the uh, pipeline and portfolio we have at the moment uh, that looks at Blue carbon, not not directly, perhaps more indirectly, some more than others. Um, I think Kenne mentioned earlier from from her presentation the um, the concept notes um, on on mangrove forests. That one is is one good example. Um, it's currently um, being being further reworked by the by the accredited entity and and the government. I believe I'm, I'm not involved in, in, in myself in that one at the moment. But um, uh, then we have also another one. Um, looking at several countries in the in the caribbean uh, region uh, looking more at the coral reef resilience um, so here you have two examples um, of, of projects we you know that that you know, eventually could be replicated in other countries or, or, or inspire other uh, future projects in particular it's very interesting to see multi-country projects i believe and this is something we are going further towards in our um, new cycle now we would like to to uh, stimulate more um, let's say ecosystem-wide projects that share an ecosystem perhaps or that target the same challenges in their different um, different countries we have uh, outside the uh, lac region uh, some projects that may be of inspiration to you and um, there are not many but i listed two here one in vietnam and one in india that is looking at rebuilding uh, the resilience of coastal communities and um, restoring mangroves. Um, we don't have many, unfortunately, but of course, I mentioned we would like to see many more coming coming forward, um, as this is a key area for us. Um, and one thing we're doing to actively promote this is actually uh, currently on our sector guidance. You may have uh, heard about this before, but the uh, GCF Secretariat is currently developing sector guidance for all the result areas. So um, I'm involved in the sector guidance for the forest and land use, but also on the ecosystems, which uh, directly influence or have, have um, a focus on uh, blue carbon, in, in particular, the, the ecosystem one. Um, here you see a slide on, on, on the, um, just a quick, quick update on the forest and landscape, uh, forest and land use uh, sector guidance. Um, where basically the sector guidance aims to identify the paradigm shift in each result area and, and it is to become a guidebook or a tool for countries and accredited entities 
to support them in developing uh, future projects to to help them uh, be as innovative as possible um, it's not a list that that provides all the solutions but it's more as an inspiration uh, for countries and accredited entities um, and for example here um, one one issue here in the forest and land use is that uh, mangrove restoration for example could could very well feature in on the forest restoration and deforestation and and also sustainable management um, it's not explicitly uh, mentioned you know mentioned throughout the document uh, and unfortunately i'm not able to share these documents uh, with you yet they're currently being finalized in-house and we aim to have across the secretariat uh, finalized guide, guide, uh, guidance uh, documents by the end of the year, hopefully, where after they will be able to be shared with, with the wider public. Uh, looking more at the ecosystem uh, services and ecosystem uh, uh, services uh, guide, uh, guidance uh, document, here, more specifically, we are, we are trying to see um, how blue carbon can, can be further uh, promoted. Um, by first of all looking at how can we recognize it in the inter in the international framework and, and in the alignment with the NDCs, um, what what kind of, uh, of investment can be mobilized uh, at scale here that can really um, promote blue carbon and can really come up with a very innovative um, use. Um, looking here at, at blended finance and and you know, mixing also our our different uh, financial instruments that we provide. And finally, also looking at how how can we uh, further promote the the science and the quantification of of the potential object. There's already a lot of data and, and science already, but how can we also um, it for the future projects? Um, one one other um, um, very interesting thing here that that will really also help, I think, in in developing future projects is this very new uh, manual we have produced. Um, the DCA programming manual. It's it's a living document that will be updated as we as we uh, go forward, and it provides a very good overview of, um, of of guidance and and good suggestions on how to develop proposals for, for us, how to align them with our investment criteria, um, what are the key steps at the early early stage in terms you know in terms of project uh, idea development. Um, the uh, concept note stage, the funding proposal stage. So all the stages going through uh, what are the key aspects and um, key tools to to keep in mind. So it's a very good, uh, very good start uh, to to start developing ideas. I would say and, and can provide you with a very good, um, very good process as well. Um, before I, uh, I I end my presentation, just to highlight um, that as I mentioned, um, part of this sector guidance. Um, and part of the overall uh, ambition we have is to uh, see um, more focus as well on, on multi-country projects. Um, is to really see how, through using the sector guidance that will be available later this year, how how we can stimulate uh, projects that that really are very as ambitious as uh, and innovative as possible, uh, um, and and have a paradigm shift that is um, as as transformative as as needed be. Um, that really have that long-term effect. That I think it's important to uh, to note here that uh, projects that are able to show, uh, first of all, why why the DCF uh, funds are needed and how they will be used in a way to uh, scale up something already on the ground or pilot something, and how that will have a long-term sustainability. I think those are key aspects in. In, in having a very good concept note uh, later approved. Um, we have a new uh, process uh, in-house where basically concept notes uh, would need to be cleared by our climate investment committee. Um, and then they will be giving the green light uh, by senior management to proceed um, to funding proposals. So it's a very good opportunity to at a very early stage involve our senior management and have that uh, buy-in from the secretariat for a future funding proposal. Um, so, so, whereas we in the past did not present concept notes to senior management, only the fund proposals. Um, so this is a good opportunity to very early in the in the process uh, have that discussion on on making the concept notes as as aligned to to our uh, criteria and policies as possible. Um, before before ending my presentation here, just just to highlight, as I mentioned earlier, I'd be very happy to. Um, 
to discuss further with you, please feel free to contact me anytime. And uh, if I'm not able to answer your questions, I'll be happy to put you in touch with all of my colleagues that may be more familiar with that particular project you, you have in mind. Or if you have any other questions, I can also direct them to other parts of the Secretariat. So thank you very much for your, for your attention and, and looking forward to, to our discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mark. This was extremely clear, very targeted. Um, I truly enjoyed your presentation. I think you gave us a lot of good tips and, and also on, on what has been the trend, but what will be also a, a future trend uh, for, for successful funding. Um, okay, in this, this chat, we've learned two things. MBS is not only nature-based solutions, it's also the North Basin Shield program from um, Guyana and Suriname, but also that you cannot have the chat open at the same time that the speaker is talking because it's disturbing him. So now we are opening the chat for questions, please. So basically, those of you who have questions for Mark about um, the Green Climate Fund, please uh, use the, uh, the grid and chat. Uh, well, well, uh, there is one question, sorry. Um, uh, uh, Suriname actually was asking, um, let, me, let me read the question, it's easier. So they, they believe that one thing that will be a challenge is how to promote allocating funds to research to include in project proposals to the uh, Green Climate Fund. Often we see that these funds um, don't go exactly where the government wanted them to go. So what is your experience with that? And I think this also relates maybe to the, the lack of data. So sometimes they could also like to get funding to get data. So let me quickly, uh, Mark, repeat the question. One thing that the uh, Suriname colleagues would think is a challenge is how to promote allocating funds to research to include in project proposals to the Green Climate Fund. Well, thank you, thank you, Rosa, and, and also thank you to uh, Suriname for this very good question. Um, indeed, it's it's um, it's it's um, it's a very good discussion that you know, of course, needs to happen. I think very early in the process between the country uh, and between the chosen accredited entity, um, basically looking at first of all what is the uh, ambition of the project, uh, where would you like to go with the project, and how. How can that best be, uh, let's say, facilitated by the choice of the accredited entity that that, that the government and the country would uh, has has chosen? You know, different different accredited entities um, have you know different strengths um, and and different expertise, and also um, have a different accreditation. Some are able to uh, access grants only. Some are able to also access loans and so forth. So it it depends also on the on the type of project that you would like to uh, to work with, um, on the on the point here of research, it, it is a little bit tricky, perhaps, to have um, most of the funds going into that. But one one way to do it would be on the uh, knowledge management sort of output or components, where um, you know, key part that the, that we would like to see in projects is is how all that data generated, information generated by a project can can be used by a wider audience and and can be hosted by the government in, in different databases or systems and can be further uh, used by, by others, in, including research, of course. So one way I could see what, what this could fit in would be to integrate it in a, in a, dedica a dedicated knowledge management um, output where, for example, um, one good example we have seen many times is, for example, when uh, projects stimulate or promote land use planning. Then all that data generated from that planning process can then further be used to also help the communities and, and the partners, for example, to develop investment plans based on what are the best investments tied to, to the, those different land uses uh, across that, that, you know, a, a particular landscape. Um, and there, there's a lot of data that then would be shared with, with different sectors, private sector or, or investors. But also here, you could very well in, you know, integrate uh, research as well. So I think there's a lot of room for, for uh, flexibility there. Um, if you have a specific um, project in mind, I'll be happy to, or, or a specific idea in mind, I'll be happy to, to come back to that later on, or, or we could follow up on that offline. Thank you. Mark, um, 
there are a couple of questions, one from Colombia, following in on this uh, latest comment that you've made about the regional projects. And they want to ask, uh, so how, how would that work uh, considering that countries' priorities vary so much? How these multi-country projects related to blue carbon uh, in terms of research policy, uh, implementation, mitigation, adaptation would work? Um, do, you, do you foresee some, some maybe uh, guidance already at this stage of how to align the interests of, of different countries? No, thank you. Thank you, Rosa, and also thank you uh, to Colombia for this. Um, indeed, a very good question, and, and I don't have a straight answer, uh, to be honest with you. It, it's really context-specific, and, um, and given that we are just starting on, on blue carbon, let's say, uh, it, it's quite new to us, so, so we are very open, of course, to ideas here from your side, colleagues. Um, basically, I think when doing multi-country projects or programs, um, there are different ways to do it. Um, one could be to have, let's say, one regional component uh, or one component that links all the countries and then other components are very uh, country specific, for example, um, within the same ecosystem, but, but specific to that particular country uh, and thereby sharing that those lessons and, and best practices across the countries could be one way to do it, uh, stimulating different types of investments or private sector, uh, buy-in for example um, this would also go in directly with research i guess let's say you would scale up uh, certain research uh, experiences or results from one area of, of, of how to promote a certain solution that may work in other areas um, for example that could be one way to do it uh, to stimulate that kind of um, access and discussion across, across countries but but there's no probably good answer to this, but it's very specific. So um, again, happy to, to follow up with you after the call if you have, uh, you know, have the need to do, you know, happy to do so. Thank you. Perfect, Mark, I have a question for you, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into a couple last questions. Um, we were looking in the first session about the overlapping of projects that can merge uh, areas that are uh, included for the, Red Plus for voluntary carbon market, and, and I know this is a very tricky question because, as as the as because of your connection with UNFCCC and all the uh, connection with the uh, payment for ecosystem services, uh, sorry, payment for performance based uh, results within UNFCCC, you have this double version, right? So, in, on the one hand, you have this funding for projects that are independent of, of, of UNFCCC. Uh, or somehow independent in the terms that we're not talking about payment for, for performance based. And then uh, you do have the other funding that is more for, for performance based action, right? So maybe you could clarify this a bit, these two line of actions that differ. And then in the case of, of this payment for performance based or support for NDCs, or, um, how do you think there will be more clear guidance? Because we still are waiting for Article 6 of the Paris Agreement to understand a bit how the, the carbon market is going to work. Yeah? I, I hope I made my, the question clear. If not, let me know and I'll ask it again. Yeah? No, no, thank you, Rosa. That's, that's a very good question and um, I'll try to, uh, to, to give a good answer. <laughs> um, indeed, it, it's... Um, a key part of our past uh, few years of, of support has been um, to the uh, Red Plus results-based payments. We have a pilot program that was launched in, uh, in 2017 and is running uh, until 2022, um, where we basically um, pay for past results that, that countries have achieved and that have been uh, reported to the UNFCCC. So um, regarding the voluntary uh, market, we currently cannot directly uh, support payments in that regard because what under the um, that um, pilot program um, we pay directly for results that have been uh, verified by the UNFCCC through the um, reporting of the, the technical annexes uh, to the uh, biennial update reports um, and that is what we base our payments on which is then later um, going to a scorecard where we uh, identify a certain score uh, for those reported results and then uh, pay against that. Then uh, those payments uh, or proceeds will have to be reinvested then in the country uh, in alignment with the NDC uh, as part of the Red, uh, Red Plus strategy 
and and so forth and of course not be reinvested into activities that may um, cause deforestation or, or, or forest degradation um, when it comes to the um, uh, article 6 of course there are a lot of very good opportunities and we have a lot of have had a lot of good discussion on how we can move forward in particular now you know as I mentioned on the sector guidance um, here we, we have many ideas future carbon markets but but it's still very uh, very early to to say anything like the zero so I mean we have to wait until there's more clarity on on article 6 on that regards um, Maybe maybe I'll stop here and I can happy to, to elaborate later. I hope I answered your question. Okay, Rose. Yes, yes. Yes, you did. And, and actually, this is, I think, a thank you so much, Mark. Um, I, I think the topic also that confuses a bit all of us is uh, if, if the countries are already having the red plus, for instance, for mangroves and blue carbon as part of their national uh, mitigation targets and, and, and they could maybe access finance through that, but at the same time, they're putting other projects that also incorporate the mitigation role of mangroves. Uh, is this over, is this requesting two times the same thing? Sorry, maybe you answered it. Uh, maybe you could answer slightly again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, sure. Yeah, so let's say, I mean, in the, in the case of a country having uh, results um, um, reported to, to UNFCCC, um, that, that would include uh, coastal forests or mangrove forests. Then, then in principle, uh, those results reported to the C and then later reported or submitted to us, uh, or you know, with a certain volume offered to us, uh, of course, could 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 very well be be the case. So far, we haven't had any cases like that, but 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 for sure in the future it could happen. Then the opportunity for for that particular country to then reinvest the um, let's say the use of proceeds could very it's very very flexible so basically our terms of reference for 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 this pilot program are very very flexible on the use of proceeds uh, that the country wishes to do um, we had from the past projects approved by the board very different use of proceeds um, one was to uh, establish a national climate change fund one was to uh, uh, one is now to look at at, at expanding a, a pest program so that there's a lot of flexibility, and of course, one could one could design uh, the use of proceeds here to to actually restore mangroves if one wanted to do so. That uh, there's nothing that um, that would stop a country from doing that. So so that is one opportunity. Um, I have to say that the pilot program is currently um, we are, are currently exhausting the funds, uh, but we are already working on an on an extension. Um, whether it will be a new pilot program or uh, simply a second phase or, or dedicated window is still unsure. Um, we are working with a um, company um, to, to help us uh, develop and shape these ideas and hope to have something ready uh, to share with the public uh, fairly soon. Um, where, where, of course, there will be much more opportunity to, to discuss these things and also um, we hope to have more private sector uh, buy-in, but it's still too early to say at this point what, what exactly it would look like. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Margie. A lot of interesting also connections with private sector as bilateral funding uh, countries and governments that maybe could, could be coordinated through the uh, Green Climate Fund. Uh, what, what you said is rather interesting. I, I thought through the Green Climate Fund countries could access the funding directly, but what I'm hearing from you is that whatever comes from performance-based or from, from mitigation achievements would be reinvested in different options that countries can choose whatever fits them best, right? But not necessarily accessing, accessing the funds directly. Is that what you're saying when you're talking about reinvesting funds? Yes, so, so this, only, this only goes for this, this, these particular projects, the uh, resource-based payment projects. Um, this is only part of the, uh, the pilot program. For other non non uh, resource based payment projects, um, basically this this pilot program is only to support the the last phase of Red Plus, where phase one and phase two um, can be targeted under um, our other funding modalities, such as a regular funding proposal or a simplified approval process. Um, we actually have a new um, a new modality under our simplified approval process. It's uh, uh, projects up to ten million, and there's one particular um, uh, such project or uh, project type modality that focuses on on uh, red plus 
to basically support countries to uh, meet the, uh, the washer framework requirements to be able to, to and, and, and eligible to receive payments uh, in the future. So that is a new new modality we, we created last year. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility to target phase one and phase two um, there. Um, so for re regarding resource-based payments, it's, it's only to that pilot program so far. Um, that, that's the only option we have at the moment. Oh, great. I understood. Thank you so much. There is so much to learn on these topics. Thank you so much, Mark. You were extremely <laughs> um, clear and very targeted and very much for, for, for being here. Um, thank you everyone to the governments in the region for joining us in the second session of this Blue Carbon. I think we've learned a lot thanks to the experiences of the government of Australia that had to get up rather early to be with us today. So thanks so much, uh, Tertius, for, for joining us and, and also for all these insights into your tier three modeling for the growth and all the data that uh, you're incorporating uh, for SOARS and so on. Uh, thank you also to Keen and to Mark, and uh, I hope we will be sharing these slides on the recording of this session uh, and send the, an email to all of you who have registered so that you can more quietly reread this information and contact the, the panelists uh, for further information. So thanks a lot and happy Mangrove Days this 26th Sunday. Enjoy uh, our blue carbon. Let's enjoy our blue carbon uh, ecosystems. Thanks very much. Have a good evening or rest of the day. Thank you.